Hey guys, and welcome to this midweek episode of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now, this episode will be specifically around coronavirus and OCD, specifically around answering your questions that you sent in. Um, thank you so much for sending those in. Um, for others, I sent, I asked the question or sent a survey via my email list. Um, so thank you to everyone that responded to that. Um, your questions will make up pretty much the core of this episode. And I got on Dr. John Grayson to answer those questions and if you listen to the show regularly then you'll be familiar with Dr. John Grayson. Um, he specializes in treating OCD and has done so for more than 40 years um, and John always talks about uncertainty. That's why John was the first therapist I thought about when I thought about doing an episode on coronavirus. So if you need more support at this time obviously reach out to your therapist or a therapist. Um, obviously the OCD charities are there you can contact them and uh I just wanted to give a trigger warning for this episode. Now, I don't usually do trigger warnings, um, but I thought I would do one because the coronavirus is something um, most of us, if not all of us, globally are facing at this time. There's lots of uncertainty. So because of that, I wanted to do a trigger warning that you may find this episode particularly triggering. So I'll leave it in your best judgment to decide whether you continue to listen or not. But I did create this episode with John because I wanted to answer some of your questions and hopefully those questions uh, appeal to all of you listening and you can find some ideas and hope within the answers and a disclaimer this episode is not advice about the coronavirus that you know listen to your governments and the health bodies and medical professionals in your country about the safe practices and what to do around the actual virus this episode is just focused on OCD side of things the worries the anxiety that many of us are feeling as a result of um, the virus. So I hope this episode helps you. And, uh, you know, my thoughts and wishes go out to you and your family at this time. And I'm wishing you all the best. And uh, here is Dr. John Grayson. On the podcast today, I have Dr. Jonathan Grayson. John has been specializing in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder for more than 40 years. And is the author of Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Welcome back, and thanks for covering this topic, John. It's a pleasure. Good to talk to you, as always. Yeah, and I'll quickly caveat, I do have a sore throat, and I don't believe it's in any way linked to the virus, just to, I guess, reassure people. Um, but... And we're only 3,000 miles apart, <laughs> so that's good social distancing. Exactly. It's it's far more than the, whatever, 10 feet or so they recommend. I think it's less than that. I don't know. It don't... is. It yeah. is. Okay, cool. But follow the government's guidelines. Um, so these are all, this episode will be entirely of listener questions. So um, let's get to the first one, which is, um, we are encouraged to hand wash a lot now. I'm worried this may develop into an OCD theme where it was never a theme for me before. How do I prevent that from happening or where do I draw the line? Well, we're just jumping right into the whole issue of, uh, you know, I think there are three issues, you know, there's coping with the uncertainty of this pandemic. Uh, it, it probably will make some people's OCD worse just because it's a very stressful time. And right. How do I not make my OCD worse? Um, and, and first of all, it's very important to listen to the government guidelines. And when I say that, because listening to the guidelines, uh, is usually not good enough for somebody who wants to approach the guidelines in an obsessive compulsive way. Mm. Right. So, you know, they talk about a 20 second hand wash as anybody could tell me with contamination, a 20 second hand wash once is not good enough. So in a sense, although it's not my ideal exposure, uh, but this is what we're doing these times. So yes, I would say doing a 20 second hand wash and knowing because there's exposure built into it. When you're doing this 20 second hand wash, you have to know going in, it's not gonna feel good enough. You have to know going in that as you're making the hand motions, and I have gone over this with clients, we practice, what do the hand motions look like? Because this is not gonna be the 20 seconds and I'm getting every finger and every crevice and all that done. You're not doing that. You are 
just swishing your hands around and you're moving them around in a pretty random way and you're probably covering everything. And the idea is that the soap on it, you know, even though you may not be specifically rubbing every air area, the soap is probably getting to every area. And as I said, probably because OCD is living with uncertainty. So mm-hmm. in just the hand washing, if you're going to, li- you know, and, and, you know, I would be very rigid about not doing more than 20 seconds, not more than one hand wash. So, you know, right there, we already have exposure going on. I said, not my ideal, but it's exposure because you can't really wash perfectly. You know, certainly if you're home and you haven't left the house and no one's come in your house, there's a whole lot less reason to be doing those things because you haven't brought anything in. You know, if you've gone out and you want to come in the house and wash your hands first, you know, that currently would be a government guideline. So that would be okay. If you were out of the house and you were going to eat, washing your hands before you eat, you know, okay, that would fall within a government guideline. Um, It gets a little dicier when we talk about surfaces, you know, um, and people, people can make up all kinds of things. You know, I just want to say I, I was uh, we had a support group last week where we were talking about the virus and uh, I, I was pleased to say that everybody in my group uh, was actually coping better than their families. Hmm. Uh, but one fellow with uh, who had had contamination he has under control, he was saying, you know, he's watching everybody who doesn't have OCD act OCD. And, and be crazier than he is now. And he, he's really kind of, you know, and, and maybe not the best way, but kind of enjoy it. But he also sees all the flaws in their rituals. He feels like I should hire myself out now. Like I could help them perfect it and at least like cash in and all this stuff that I've learned from doing that over the time. So I, I think, you know, in terms of washing surfaces, you know, the government's talking about hard surfaces, but again, what are you doing on those surfaces? And, and, um, what is your, you know, how much contact are you having with them? You know, so, you know, they're saying to sanitize the surface, but who's been around and who's on that surface? And, you know, why are you sanitizing the surface in this particular case? You know, because again, if you're out, you're probably, you're potentially t- touching stuff. It's going to be on your hands. The recommendation is don't touch your face. So there's going to be a lot of limiting to going on. Uh, and, and that's why I say we're following the guidelines. Some people say, well, what about clothing? The government is not saying to do anything about clothing. So you don't do anything about clothing. And along the lines in trying to develop something realistic to do, um, don't watch the news constantly. Anything you need to know, you could pretty much pick up in 20 minutes of CNN once a day. You know? you definitely should not search the net because like all net searching, you can find people saying all kinds of crazy things that go way beyond, you know, the world health organization and whatever your government is telling you to do. So, you know, we definitely don't want people doing more than than what they're being told to do. Um, I know you and I have talked Stuart and uh, Shala nicely, who's, you know, been on your show and a wonderful OCD therapist has a, you know, tip sheet for managing coronavirus and concerns, you know, and I'll send you the link and uh, it can be made available. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's basically the same advice I'm saying. Uh, certainly you have a therapist uh, who's, you know, works with OCD. I would use them to help you with guidelines uh, to help you not cross over the line. Hmm. I didn't know I had so much to say. Yeah. <laughs> that was good. And obviously that question was about, um, kind of what if my my I've never had contamination OCD before what happens if it now becomes contamination OCD and this would be a way to prevent it I guess also well, exactly and I, I completely see that worry you know this is the news is everywhere and so it's almost if your theme's going to shift it wouldn't surprise me if it shifted to this and it's definitely yeah. tried that for me personally um, and I did kind of lose sight of things but I, I kind of pulled it back when I realized I was slipping into bad uh, ways um uh I mean yeah so but, yeah. but let, let's ask for someone who actually has contamination OCD theme already um let's assume they're kind of they've got a hierarchy and that they're exposing to their contamination 
how would you differ how you're working with them right now? Or yeah. There would definitely be differences. I was going to say, you know, I think one of the things that might be scariest to people who know me is hearing that I'm washing my hands since I haven't done that since 1979. Um, so it's kind of a shock Sorry, for me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, I do have to modify treatment somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, so exposures I do in the outside world, I can't do those the same. You know, so I'm not having people go in public restrooms. I am not currently going in dumpsters and all of those things, you know, so, so that's temporarily going to be less. However, and, and although it's not as good, but I mean, let's say if we're talking about a fear where somebody doesn't like toilets, there is no reason to avoid the toilet at home. There's no reason I can't do have the person doing all kinds of exposures at home with the toilet or with the home trash or the home garbage, you know, so, so that is, you know, it's not quite as good because most people feel their home toilet is not as bad as let's say a public restroom, but so I can do those kind of things. Um, you know, so, so I, I mean, I think in this case, you know, treatment has become more homebound in that sense um, <clears throat> in terms of what we wouldn't want them to wipe off. You know, I, I don't want somebody sanitizing their whole house you know if you haven't gone outside today there's no reason to use sanitizer on anything in the house so the house doesn't need to be perfectly clean you know if you were out and you come in fine you know you put your stuff down you go right to the sink you wash your hands for your 20 seconds um you don't like take a shower treat everything you own as if it's you know the plague Right. The government's not telling us to do that. Um, if you wanted to say you want to wash your phone, I want to know where, you know, has your phone been out today? You know, have you actually touched your phone um, with, when, you know, a time when you know your hands are contaminated? Because for a lot of people, like the phones, you know, in their pocketbook or purse. And again, that would be a very quick kind of thing to do to the phone. That would take you like five seconds because, again, never going for perfection. Mm -hmm. Um so there, there are a lot of things not to do, you know, that would feel like a contamination once one got home. Yeah. I don't know if that fully no. answers. I mean, it all, yeah. Yeah, it was a complex question, but no, I think, yeah. I think that, that does, yeah. It's drawing the lot. It's, it's as I guess with any kind of <clears throat> recovery from most but contamination generally, contamination OCD, that is, it's always the battle is drawing that line between what is good hygiene versus what is obsessive compulsive behavior well i know you say that mm. and i just want to say because i know i'll get to go back to this life technically what i've done up to now would be not good hygiene okay you know because because one of the things you know that i think most therapists do i know i do this whatever i tell clients to do i do so before the virus when i say i didn't wash my hands i mean i didn't wash my hands you know, I had to be like working in a car or the garden. So when people say, well, what about after the bathroom? It's like, no, I didn't wash my hands. So I haven't done that for 40 years. Um, and, and, you know, going in dumpsters, sticking my hand in my mouth and all those things are technically not good hygiene and are not safe. But if they were, you know, if they were very, very dangerous, me, my colleagues and all the people we treated should have been getting really sick or dying off and we don't see any higher rates. So I'm not saying they're safe, but they were statistically safe. Mm. Um, at this point in time, you know, we need to take a different tack because, you know, because of this particular virus. And um, can I talk about the virus a little bit? Yeah. So, so one of the things that people don't seem to understand, and I, I believe my understanding is correct, you know, the, the big talk is we're trying to flatten the curve with these uh, precautions. Mm. My understanding is flattening the curve does not mean less people will get the coronavirus. They're kind of expecting the same number of people to get it, which is to say that in the long run kind of way, no one is expecting all of the things we're being told to do to work. You know, mm. it's a delay tactic. Yeah. Now, 
the reason that's critical is if everybody gets, you know, if we have an explosion of cases that takes place over a month, there will be a lot of excess death and a lot of horrible things because hospitals will be overloaded and they won't be able to treat people. So people who would be able to receive treatment to survive, it won't be there. I know that sounds scary, but, you know, it is a scary thing. You know, in the U.S., 80,000 ventilators, I understand, and, you know, potentially a prediction of 80 million people getting this, meaning 2 million people will not will not make it. Another 6 million people will also need ventilators who will make it if they're available and won't if they're not. So we're trying to spread out the time people are getting it so that everybody would have access to medical things. But it doesn't mean we're going to escape getting it. So that sounds scary to everybody. And again, the thing is, luckily, most of us Hmm. won't die from this. I'm slightly older, so I'm in the group at higher risk. Hmm. But the odds are still in my favor. So, you know, that's that's all I've got. And, you know, it's like dealing with all uncertainties. The thing with this is we don't have control. Hmm. And, you know, to run from this as if we do have control will make people feel crazy. I I always say to people who come to me that when you overcome OCD, you are not normal. You are better than normal. And again, in my recent support group, everybody indeed was doing way better than their families because they know how to handle uncertainty. The average person, although better than an OCD sufferer who's in the middle of symptoms, isn't really good at handling uncertainty. But they don't, you know, it's not often in their life they get confronted. Now you see what they do when they're confronted, Mm -hmm. you know, in the sense it's like, you know, I know many people with OCD, it's like, wow, look at them. They they don't look any different than me because they they are not good at handling it. Um, So many people are going to get sick and most of us will survive and it's scary as that is, it's not good to run away from it because if you say something can't happen, well, you know your mind, your mind goes, yes, but maybe it can. And in this case, maybe it can, you know, and this uncertainty is the, I, I feel safe in saying this, is probably the greatest uncertainty anybody's ever faced who's alive. Because Right. We don't have anybody alive who's really lived through a pandemic. Hmm. You know, Spanish flu happens in 1918. So, you know, the few people alive are really old and they might have been babies at the time. So this is completely uncharted territory. We know a bunch of bad things will happen. And and I think it's okay to be worried about them and scared of them, just not panicked. Hmm. Right. A lot of businesses will not make it. A lot of people are going to be in financial trouble. You know, luckily we have some kind of social net to take care of people, but it's going to be stress. And, you know, it's like, I guess the only good thing is everybody will understand everybody because they're all going to be in the same situation. But it's going to be a very strange world that we're living in. You know, it's not permanent, but it's going to be for a long time. And I think nobody really knows what's going to happen. But that fear is normal, you know. Our goal is never so much to con- to conquer fear and never be afraid. Life is stress. We just don't want to make stress worse than it has to be. Hmm. You know, so most of us, you know, we have families or where, you know, we're, we're where we are right now. We're going to spend more time with family. Um, you know, how am I going to try to cope? What, what am I going to do to make this time uh not as bad as it has to be yeah yeah i think i said that backwards uh i did yeah yeah may may not making it yeah yeah not making it worse than it has to be i don't know i said that anyway go on i get i get your point i'll never know you'll yeah i (laughs) um yeah i think that's a good point and i think also um this time although scary and uncertain um and like you said, most of us will survive it. Um, the stats already show that. Um, but it's 
there's also opportunity, like you said, whether it's getting to spend more time with family because many of us have mm-hmm. to work from home now or, you know, or, or the places we work to temporarily shut down. Um, or it's an opportunity to reach out um, maybe through online means because of social distancing, but like and, and helping others. And I've seen that a lot through my network. So many people have stepped mm. up and they're helping the elderly. They're reaching out to people in different countries. Yeah. And that that real unity yeah. is really impressed me about the kind mm-hmm. of human spirit that times like this kind of really reveal. My, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So next question. Um <clears throat> from a listener which is uh have I, yeah this one so what tips have you got for someone that has recently developed intrusive thoughts about a loved one dying as a result of covid19 i have never really had intrusive thoughts of this nature before you know if somebody could see my face when you ask that question you know there's a little bit of a long pause mm-hmm. uh and, and partially it's because I do know the answer, <laughs> but it's um, it's a hard answer. Mm. You know, it, it's it's you know obviously it's a kind of thing that somebody's going to have to really work on because if it was just a simple answer that I could give and was like instantly good, then it really wouldn't be a problem. The first thing is, you know what this individual is doing and what happens in all OCD when I'm confronting uncertainty that, you know, the, the phrasing basically goes, what if, no, that can't happen. I don't want that. And it doesn't matter whether it's something likely or unlikely, you know, so I don't care if it's like, if I've been taken over by aliens Mm. or what if somebody I know dies of COVID-19. So, they're trying to desperately want to know that can happen. And the only way they would be able to get that kind of comfort would be to be stupid. Because again, research has shown the only people who are certain are stupid. People with OCD tend to be above average intelligence. So you don't get that option. So the issue is how would I cope with it now? For the person to say, but that would be horrible, and I'm upset, and I don't want that. And it's like, yes, it would be horrible. You know, I mean, acceptance, which always sounds so nice, you know, everybody has this little picture of Zen happiness, as opposed to the truth that acceptance sucks. Mm -hmm. Acceptance means I'm going to have, I'm going to have life that's a second best life because the first best isn't available to me. So, Right now, the one level of acceptance, somebody I know, somebody I love might die of COVID-19. The only thing I have is odds in my favor, but I don't have more than odds. And I can't really protect them. I might be able to raise the odds of them getting it a little bit. But again, we're talking flattening the curve, not not getting it. So people are going to get it. This will happen. This might happen. And, and the really sad thing of thinking about how would I cope with this is the answer. Like, what do you do when they get sick? What do you do afterwards? I would go through every painful stage. And somebody's going like, I don't want to do that. That's horrible. But that's what prevents people from coping. You know, I could ask any parent, well, what if your kid dies? And like, that's it. That's the end. Like, hmm. um, okay, but, but what if it did happen? You know, like, what do you do that day? And there are people like, oh, you know, you know. I, I would fall apart now. And if they have two kids, I always say, well, so what are you going to do about the other kid? Don't you have to show them that this is something to cope with? And suddenly it's like, oh, no matter how bad I feel, I have to survive for that kid. And I'd be asking people, okay, I always think when I say, what would you do? How would you try to cope? That is, I don't want you to imagine falling apart. You're good at that. How would you try to go through it? How would you try to gradually get back? You know, so recovering from the death of a loved one, that's like a year long process. You know, we don't like to think about it, you know, but if you ask somebody like, what do you do when they first happens and they say, I'm going to freak out, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? I'm going to scream. How long are you going to do that? Uh, An hour. Okay. What do you do after the hour? Are you eating dinner that night? Are you going to sleep that night? Are you eating breakfast? Are you ever eating again? 
are you going to prepare for the funeral? Do you want to honor that loved one? I like asking that because I find very few people who say no. Because the answer to that question is, they're gone and they would want you to live. So if you want to honor their memory, you have to live. You know, is that second best? Absolutely. You know, I think I think the trouble, you know, when, when the person's worried about this, it's so hard for them to imagine because without me even speaking, they realize right off the bat, how can he possibly have an answer that's happy? <laughs> you know, I don't want to think about them. I want to know that they're not going to like, I don't want to worry about it. I want to be like blind to it. Hmm. But people with OCD are too smart. And I don't think it's bad that the question's asked because I think that's the beginning of coping. That's why people, you know, not non-sufferers don't have to answer the question, but then they're not ready for it. If you have OCD, you get heaven or hell. You ask the question, if you try to run from it, it's hell. If you try to figure out how to live with it, then you get to be one of the few who copes with uncertainty. So there is a bunch of stuff to do, you know. And I think probably some of it's outlined in my book and other places on morning, you know, even on morning, but because, you know, the process in a sense is the same. It's like, how would I live through this? And if it makes you cry to think through this, that's okay. You know, in a way, people are always thinking about this because how many TV shows, how many movies involve death? Mm. We watch them because we're vicariously trying to cope with it because, right, none of us like it. We all, in a way, have the question of how could I ever survive that? Some movies, people survive it. Some people do terribly. But, you know, where they're all different answers. So it's essentially exposure. In a, you know, it's just that. Exposure always sounds simple, but really what's behind it is complex. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, I'm just wrapping my head around it. But yeah, the yeah, the intrusive thoughts around the loved one potentially dying. Um, and as we know of OCD, for all I know, this person, their loved one could be a, a 20-year-old athlete male or female that's like in peak physical form and statistically from the data we have at the minute the younger healthier seem to fare better and get not many symptoms either so in that sense that would seem like much more of an ocd worry of not just well i'm sure we all feel uncertainty to a point around (laughs) our loved ones but for that you know what i'm saying i just i know where you're trying to go but i I, I was gonna i feel like arguing (laughs) okay go for it (laughs) I don't think OCD worry is is mm-hmm. defined by likelihood or not likelihood. Mm-hmm. So you're saying, well, it seems, and, and, you know, it's kind of funny hearing you say it because I know that it's not really true in your own life. Um, odds never really made any difference, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. So yes, odds are way better for that younger person, but the odds suck if you want it to be a zero. Yeah, it's true. And um, and so, yes, they could be worrying about their 80 year old grandparent who, you know, has some heart problems or the peak condition and um, odds are in their favor for both. But both could die. And, and I think, you know, I always argue that there's no such thing as an intrusive thought. I always feel a thought is an OCD thought if I want one of two things. I want to know what it means. Or I don't want to think it. I do either of those and that's the end because there's no way to not do that. And it's actually useful to go through the pain of thinking this thought. I mean, in a way, it's the body, it's the mind trying to cope with this beforehand to, to not be, to be able to cope because it will be devastating. I'm not going to argue with that. But, you know, there are people who handle death better and people who don't handle it as well. And, you know, handling it well doesn't mean it doesn't bother you. You know, I mean, six months after you've lost someone, it's still really awful. Mm. Um, but but I'm slowly reaching the point where I am also living again. I'm reaching the point where I am not saying every moment a statement of denial with death, which is life would be better if they were here. That's a statement of denial because I'm comparing real life to a fantasy of where they're here. 
Initially, when somebody dies, no matter who you are, me or anybody, they restart there. As time goes on, I start to live again, and I can think about that person. I can miss them. I can cry, but I am also living. But that's a that's a process. It takes a year, and so all of us, when we think about really losing somebody, we all accurately imagine being in that first moment where it's like everything stops. And then we don't want to think past it because it, it's painful. But I'm afraid it's a useful pain. And again, all literature, you know, it's one of the major questions of literature and why people read it, because it's a way of trying to come up with that answer beforehand. Because um, highly likely that you're going to have to cope with the death of others, not from the virus, but just from living. This might make it sooner for some people. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> well, you I, I see you're supposed to smiling with a little bit of, I don't know if we call it dark humor, but, but uh, yeah, well, I don't know. I guess I think I, nerv nervous laughter, nervous laughter is good. Yeah. I think, um, cause you've, yeah, you've used this, I don't want to say tactic, but like you've talked about this before in the, in terms of like around someone I think was worried about having done something wrong potentially and getting caught and then you're like well well what would prison be like for you what would your first meal be like <clears throat> what would mm -hmm. it be like staying in a cell like almost visualizing the worst and planning it through to realize if it does happen you could handle it as opposed to worrying will this happen won't this happen is that fair to right, say right and yeah yeah and, and i say i think <clears throat> I have a very what iffy mind. I just don't get anxious about it. But it's not like I know I can handle anything. I think about it. I think about how I would hope to handle it. I, you know, trying to make it realistic, not like I'm the super tough I can handle anything. I try to think about it with the pain. I do not obsess or worry about would I actually handle it that way. I am aware that thinking this way raises the odds I'll handle it, but it's not a guarantee. That's just the hope. Mm. And like all things, I try to wait till I get there. But I, I think about it because to, you know, to say I can't think about it, well, that's just an invitation to obsess. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I think I'm trying to kind of pin you in some certainty and you're trying to pin me in the uncertainty so i appreciate that um, yes <laughs> I, I, and in this case my 40 years of practice of it you know if i can just go aside hmm. I, I actually before i knew about ocd or uncertainty that was probably something that always attracted me so that i spent my years in high school being an existentialist <laughs> thinking about uh you know nothing is real Mm. or there's no meaning to anything except what we make up. Um, so I was kind of set for this. <laughs> so, I, so I have practice is what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah, fair enough. I feel, I feel, I feel, I feel good in my ability to, to win that argument. <laughs> um, right. So the next listener question is you, you did um, answer this earlier, but I, I think I'll ask yeah. it anyway, because I think we can go into more sure. detail because I think this is, not just people with OCD, I think 80% of the general public seem to be suffering with this, which is yeah. um, any suggestions on how to stop internet researching and constant news watching while teleworking, which I think means working from home during the yeah. pandemic. Uh, I guess um, they put, I guess regular OCD coping strategies, but now it seems like information is constantly flowing. Yeah. Um, You're right. I think it bears repeating. Um, you know, it is true in every crisis. We all have this urge just to endlessly watch the same thing over and over again. Is it just, you know, updates, you know, so little each minute. Um, and, and I think You know, I think the more somebody's finding themselves upset, the more it would be good to literally limit the watching. Mm. You know, you know, the watching is addictive. You know, it's like this might be this other little piece. They say something, it's aggravating, it's not. But um, 
you can pretty much get all the information you need in about a half hour. You know, if I watch CNN in a half hour, it's going to pretty much have anything that's important that I need to need to know. Um, and, and, you know, at this point, really, there's not much new coming out about like what you need to do differently. You know, the, the that link I'll be giving you to Charlotte Nicely's uh, post pretty much has everything in one page of what we need to do. And, um, you know, things closing and everything. It's not like there's some, you know, or you find out closings. You're going to find that out in a half hour. It becomes important to make sure that you're using the rest of the time in some better way. I mean, one of the troubles with being at home, you know, often when people would retire, they have all these plans of what they're going to do. And they end up not doing them and just getting depressed because it turns out it's easier to do nothing than all the fun things, which is weird. So, you know, sometimes it would end up working McDonald's because that was better than sitting at home, even though it wouldn't be better. So in a way, sitting at home and, and, and it's not like we can go out and do stuff, you know. So the urge is to just kind of vegetate and not do anything else. And so that makes the news even easier to watch in this addictive way. And, and you know. If it were going to just be one to three weeks, it'd be like give into it. It's kind of like you have an operation, you're in pain, like, okay, for three weeks, fine, take meds, you know, to kill the pain. But if it's going to be forever, that's not going to be a good strategy. And so people really need to, you know, if it's going to be upsetting to them, I mean, if it's not upsetting to you, fine, who cares? But if it's going to be upsetting, you know, if it's interfering with things or you're feeling like you can't turn away from it, it would be good to limit it, you know, and to you know, basically watch fun TV or, or you know, or do other things because this is going to last a while, you know, so we actually do have to find out, figure out how do we live at home? You know, how do we live in this enforced environment? Because it's not clear how long it's going to be. I mean, on one hand, it seems unsustainable for months, but I don't know that it's not going to be months. So, you know, doing things like having a schedule, you know, it seems silly to have a schedule, but it's also really important because it kind of, you know, it does. There's a, there's a point at which having a little bit of order in our life is useful, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I, you know, so having some schedule and doing things like, you know, how often are you going to shower? Uh, not for an OC reason. And actually, if you have contamination, yeah, this would be a great time to limit your shower if you're not going out. You know, we can we can probably limit it to, you know, every five days or so. We used to do that regularly, always taking a shower wrong. But that aside, you know, like but like, you know, doing personal hygiene things, not so much because it's healthy, but just to be in that habit. You know, you mentioned, you know, connecting with others socially online, and that's important just to keep up contact, especially if you're more isolated, you know, if you're living alone, yes, it would be good to you know, have some kind of thing and do you have people who will schedule with you and, you know, is there an online activity you can do well? You know, some of us who are gamers, you know, this is great. You know, we're just going to play games and uh, talk to each other. But you know what I mean? It, it, to, to have some activities and, you know, what's my reading time? What's my work time? Uh, trying and, and trying to figure out how to be creative in terms of what might be interesting for me to do. So it, it, that's a long answer, which all well, my answers seem really long today to your, what about the news? But I think to not watch the news, what else am I going to do? You know, I mean, and what I'm going to have in his background, you know, I mean, I, I used to love having NPR on his background. Um, but, you know, the number, the, currently the amount of that that's going to be devoted to this is, you know, if it, if it makes me anxious or just builds on it, uh, it's not necessary. You know, somebody might say to me, but wait, Shouldn't I listen to it because it's exposure? And no, I'd rather have you do the exposure in your head. How am I going to cope with this if it keeps going on? You know, they're, they're providing numbers and statistics. And although, you know, one might say it's exposure, it's really in a way of trying to seek reassurance. You know, I want to hear, I want to hear something good. And actually, I believe, and I may be wrong in this, you're not going to hear something good. I, I, you know, I see you smile. I see you smile <laughs> as you kind of. I see. I see. I'm accidentally doing some exposure with you, where you're going like, 
wait, I don't know if I want to hear that. I don't well, know if the listeners want to hear that. Yeah. I, I don't know how I can cope if I'm going to pretend. Yeah. You know, I think life will come back at some point. There are going to be some hardships. There are going to be leftovers as a result of this, and there are going to certainly be hardships through it. If we're going to be strong, we have to be able to think, I can't run from the hardships. I'm going to have to face them. Mm-hmm. And maybe the first hardship we all have to face is that there are going to be hardships, which when I say it, I think sounds obvious. But again, nobody likes it to be said out loud. You know, it's okay if I say there are hardships. It's not okay if I say, yes, it's going to get worse, even though, you know, they, they say it's going to get worse. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going along with them. It's not me, it's them. It's them, yeah. No, I appreciate it, and that's why I got you on to do this episode. So uh, I'm okay (laughs) with it triggering me. Uh, (laughs) um, So the next question, and I think you in part answered this, was um, they've said, a big part of my recovery has been developing healthy routines, e.g. meditation, a daily walk, downtime as as well as work. However, with my son likely to be off school and all major changes to our living patterns, how can I retain or adapt my recovery routines? I'd really be curious to know if that listener was a male or a female. I'll tell you why. I've um, I, I've interpreted it as female, um, but that... I interpreted it as male. Okay, well, I'll I've... tell you why. Yeah, when when my son was little, we did do the unusual thing of uh, my wife took care of him for the first nine months or so. Then then we did this thing where I switched my schedule and I just started working nights, so I would take care of him during the day. And, you know, when you have a two or three year old before they're in school, there is no break. And I feel like all mothers know this. <laughs> all many fathers do not, you know, because it's right. I mean, if you're a mom, it's like day in and day out and it doesn't stop. And, you know, even if they're in daycare half day, they're there with you. It's like nonstop till they hit a certain age. So uh, but maybe in this day, this era of gender freedom um there are enough men who have learned this so we don't know the gender of the person it yeah. doesn't really matter but but certainly and you know I, I loved having a kid once um and i love my grandkids so i but but i mean it is as any parent can say a lot of work and um While the kids are awake, yes, you know, especially when they're under a certain age, they they are all consuming. You know, my grandson is five, and like you're pretty much going to be with him when he's awake. And and uh, you know, so my son and daughter-in-law have you know made up a schedule, you know, for him to you know that they're following with him. So they're not just free play all day. They have some kind of some kind of structure of things they're doing. Um, my wife used to be a teacher. Uh, you know, so she helped them with the schedule and, you know, they, they develop stuff and they're doing stuff. But, um, so, so I think, you know, the question with kids, you know, it might help to have some schedule. The schedule makes it a little bit easier, but yes, you're still on all day. All those other healthy activities. Yes. You know, I think it's important to how will they fit in the current schedule? Um, you know, how are they, uh, you know, so, okay, when am I going to do some meditation? When can I do exercise? You know, there still will be some time because if your kid is going to bed at 11 o'clock, I think there would be some useful child rearing things you could do to, to have them have a more normal schedule. Cause you know, somewhere between somewhere around seven ish, they should be getting to bed. And if they're the kind of kid who's really truly old enough to be open, you know, up later, they should be old enough to let you free, you know, mm. right. If I have a 14 year old up at 10 o'clock at night or 11 o'clock, it doesn't really matter because they're watching TV independently. It's the, it's the little one. So, you know, I think for little ones, uh, it's a schedule. And you know what? I, I think I don't, somebody can make money off this because there probably should be sites giving suggestions of like, you know, things you can do with your kid in ways to organize your day, you know, around, you know, what the child's, how you're going to spend time with your child. Having less time is not having no time, you know, Mm -hmm. because, uh, 
you know, let's face it, in normal life, if you know, do a full time job and kids, you know, well, one's working all day, they come home, and you know, it's still hard to fit those things in. Um, so there might be less of them. I don't think it means the end of them. Um, yeah. You know, certainly, certainly any mother with three or four kids. You know, and and if it's a little traditional and she's making dinner, it's not, you know, you talk to her about, you know, if she comes to therapy under normal circumstances, you know, I want to fit something in her free time. It's not a lot of free time that she has, you know, if she's a single parent. All right. You know, it's like, uh, you know, so this is that situation. So we expect less. um, and, And I, again, we're talking about second best. There's your ideal plan. And it would be so great if it could happen. And if you're going to focus on how great it would be if only you could have that plan, you are living in denial. And I just want to remind people, denial is whenever I compare reality to a fantasy. And fantasy always wins because we don't put any garbage in the fantasy. So in that fantasy life, I have time to do all that stuff. And that would be great. But it's a fantasy, so it's like wishing it away is just going to make the present worse because you can't have it. How am I going to make the best of this? And yes, definitely second best. But it doesn't mean losing everything. Mm. And then it's hard for people to accept second best because we don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think, um, yeah, hopefully that helps that person. And also one thing, to, so. one thing to add to that, if they like meditation, um, the app Headspace has um, meditations for children. So it's a good opportunity to use this time to get your kid into meditation by getting them to do that. And then they can sit beside you and do it potentially. Um, okay, so the next one is for... For, gen- for general mental health, when you live in a small space with family, what is the best way to cope in terms of patience and maintaining balance without losing your call cool too often? And I think most of the world, this question applies for right now. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know. This is I don't know what I was going to say. It's a wonderful thing. I don't know what really to call it. Mm. But, but a bunch of these questions, right? This is what everybody's thinking. Yeah. This is what, you know, this is uncharted territory that no one knows in a sense. Yeah, so there've always been situations for some people like this. This is now everyone. Um, so it's a fascinating question. We say, how do I keep my patience and not lose my cool? Because it becomes really hard to answer because that's a question with so many variables. Mm -hmm. Because the first variable is, what are the people like around me? (laughs) You know, because depending on the family, it could be, you know, it's an effort just because it's a new situation being this close. And and that is going to be a stress for everybody. And I think, you know what, I think, I think in the short run, we can all expect there to be extra arguing that it's going to take a while to learn how to negotiate this. It's a stress. It's a new situation. You know, things kind of fall apart under stress. And so, yeah, you know what? People are going to lose their cool. Well, I'm not saying it's carte blanche, like, okay, now it's just time to let loose curse and scream at everyone, but it's going to be harder. And so it's not a failure automatically if you're having trouble with it. Um, that said, like, what are the people I'm living with like, you know? Uh, so if I have somebody who's very difficult to live with, this is going to be much harder. Um, if I'm a very rigid person and I really like things the way they should be, and I've been generally successful in making everybody do things the right way, which is defined by what I think is right. They've learned I get really pissed off if they don't do that. This situation would be quite a challenge for them because in this case, you're losing your call because your expectations are, you know, not in line with something that would be more reasonable, even if it feels right. So at some level, I can control some of my patients 
by thinking about my expectations. And it's really hard for all of us to feel that what we think is the way to do something is not the right way. You know, I, I you know, if we're going to think that like this demand I have is really reasonable. I'm not saying they're not. So I guess, you know, I can maybe knock a little bit of it down if I can try to open-mindedly agree that, you know, maybe I may, maybe my expectation is too much, but obviously the opposite is true. Not everything I do is wrong. And some of the things would make perfect sense for me to want. That's why I was like shuddering when you asked this question, because it's like, I know there will be less patience. I, I think if there's good communication, you know, the ideal, it's like, you know, people can, after losing temper, it's like, okay, you know, certainly apologizing is always good. You know, it, it, it's, uh, if you lose your temper, no matter how justified you felt you were, even if they equally lost their temper and were screaming, it's like really useful to apologize, you know, and, and, and to try to make it a real apology, not like, I'm sorry I did this, but, you know, it really would be like, you know, gee, the you know, way I expressed all that stuff and I lost my temper, I'm sorry, that really wasn't useful. I, I, I really need to find a better way, you know, and, and um, yeah, I think, I, I hope it's something we can work on, you know, and um, so, so I think that will cover a portion. Depending who we're talking about, we're talking about people who, who will struggle and kind of do that and people who might need therapy to do that. I mean, it's just the whole range. Mm. Um, it, it's the human question of how do we learn to be in the same space together and learn to respect each other and, and hopefully have an open enough situation where we can express that. If I'm with, I'm pausing, should I say this line? Um, you know, I'm going to pay. I'm, I'm going to let you go now. Okay. I, I, think, I think I answered as well as I could. I'm sorry. I would love to have answered that one better, but it's no, no, it's a you know, re respect and apology. I think is, is, is and being open-minded yeah. will reduce the amount of arguing that's going to occur in the short run here. Cause it's definitely going to happen. Oh, absolutely. I think even people that generally get on are probably, I don't want to say everyone, but it's like even people that get on will probably fall out at some point during this process. Um, I think so. Yeah, if I think when I was a student and I was living with my best friend, like the amount of times we fell out, you know, and I, I adore him. So, mm -hmm. you know, so, yeah, I think when you were just in everyone's pockets, things happen. But communication is key and apologizing, like you said, of I shouldn't have said that or shout it or whatever it is uh, can go a long way. Yeah, um, but also the the silver lining of this spending lots of time with different people with your family uh, gives you this opportunity to work and develop those relationships. Um, In a twisted way, yeah. The stress of this, mm. and the difficulty of this, and the arguing from this, ultimately leads to a stronger relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, so so you'll even be able to enjoy it better in good times, but. Um, probably a lot of us would rather not have to go through this pain to build a stronger relationship. True. <laughs> uh, it makes marital counseling look good. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. So, uh, next listener question is, um, our usual people of support are all, are also challenged and stretched to the limits during this time. What is the best way to support our people, but also get the support we need? I love that question. Because it all, it all hinges on the one part of that statement, which is how do we get the support we need? I, I was working with a woman who was complaining about her husband. If she's listening, she'll know who she is, where she was suggesting her husband is not supportive. And I knew her well enough to say, um, I think what you mean not by not supportive is that when you're seeking reassurance, he doesn't give it to you. And, and she, she was not happy to agree because she knew I was right. So, you know, what she was describing she needed was really giving into her reassurance seeking. 
because uh, you know she felt that would make her feel better. And of course, that's not really useful. And he was really doing the right thing. So, in terms of what reassurance do I need? What, what, I'm sorry. In terms of what support do I need? I would want to know that the support was for getting better, not support for staying sick. Hmm. You know, I, I think. I think it is always a stress. You know, when a person is suffering from OCD, it is horribly painful, obviously. And, and, you know, it feels like because of this pain, you need so much help. I remember I had one client whose mother screamed at her. The mother had OCD. You don't know what it's like. And she said to her mom, but you don't know what it's like to be us. It may be, I don't know, I, I don't want to compare pain, but it is hard for family when somebody's not trying to get better because then it's like, do I make them worse by giving in? Do I make them worse by not giving in? Like, I don't know what to do. So if it's real support, um, I, I think one of the things one can do is working harder on your program, you know, because families always love, you know, one of the great things about working on the program, it's one of the few times that something you're doing in therapy is good for everyone. You know, if I have a couple come in, it might be they need to get divorced. Well, okay, that might be more good for one person, but it's going to cause havoc in the family, right? It's not like it's a happy thing. OCD you're getting control of it. You're happy. They're happy unless they have OCD and don't want to get better. But but outside of that situation, so oddly enough, working harder on your program is the way to be supportive. And, you know, most people with OCD are incredibly, incredibly empathetic. You know, I, I find they're just so understanding of other people. So I think using that skill towards your partner and, and, you know, basically there are times taking care of them, you know, like, like, what do you need, honey? Or can I do this for you? You know, whatever, whatever this is, I don't know what it is. So, um, I think when supports in the, you know, in terms of now, if somebody says like, you know, I'm doing this exposure, it's really hard for me. Okay, you know, then the person can be supportive. You know, I, I know, honey, it's really hard. You can do this. And, you know, saying things that are supportive without saying, like, and it will be safe. Um, so, so I think really to be supportive is to try to not let OCD be more important than the people around you. Hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, nice. So... I guess lastly, is there anything else that you want to say on this topic of uh, coronavirus and OCD or uncertainty? Well, you know, I do know that I can talk another six hours. Um, you know, when you first asked me to do this, I thought I had about 15 minutes of things to say. So as I've been talking in the back of my mind, it keeps going like, and this is great because, you know, it's, a, it's a, you know, it will sound a little concerned. It's like, I hope I'm not talking too much. Um, and and my, only, my only reassurance I would give myself is I'm going to depend on Stuart to shut me up. <laughs> so I'm keeping my fingers crossed that, you know, he did his job and that's mm -hmm. as good as I can get. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think I have anything to add okay. if you don't have any more questions. No, that's good. And I'm glad for you doing the talking because I don't think my voice could have handled it. <laughs> Uh, so i mean I'm, no doubt this topic has been and tough for people but um you know i really value your contribution and hopefully it's helped them too thank so, you thank you i hope it's helpful yes uh i will send you the shallow link oh excellent so there you have it thank you for listening to the episode and thank you to john for his time now there was something i quickly wanted to read before you go so one of the listeners of the podcast sent me a message earlier uh, and he wrote something that I really liked and I thought I'd share with you in case you do too. Uh, and his name's Mike, so thank you for letting me use this and share it with you guys. And it goes like this. I go through peaks and valleys, but I think as the days go by, I'm getting a better handle on things. 
I just think we have to adjust to our new normal and instead of looking at the months of disruption ahead of us and all the possible what-ifs, we just have to focus on the present moment. Minutes were turned to hours, hours to days, days to weeks, weeks to months and eventually months were turned into years and we will be able to look back at this time and think of all that we did to help the human race persevere. And I'm sure we'll be doing that in a crowded bar with some really good drinks. So draw from that message what you will. I, I've, I found it really hopeful and I wanted to share it with you guys. And uh, we're back to the usual programming as of this Sunday. And quick disclaimer, guys, this podcast is not therapy. It is not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Till we speak, take care. <laughs>